Hi, I'm Jeff Payne and you are watching Gem TV. Today we are coming to you from the beautiful sanctuary of Fervent Prayer Church where my special guest James W. Jackson is the pastor and he will be running for mayor of Indianapolis. Pastor Jackson, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We're really excited to be here and thank you for taking this interview. Uh, it's the first of the uh, Gem TV podcast that we will be presenting later on. And I wanted to start by uh, having you tell our watchers, our viewers, uh, who is James W. Jackson? Well, that's a great question. And uh, I am a longtime resident of Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, Hoosier, of course, I've lived in Indiana all my life. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. But uh, we weren't there long. My dad moved us to Indiana. Uh, I can't even remember that. When he did, I was, wasn't even one years old then. Um, father of four beautiful girls. Been married to my wife, Dee, for um, 31 years. Uh, two grandsons. Um, also um, a uh, lead pastor of the Fervent Prayer Church in Indianapolis, <clears throat> which I've been doing for the past 28 years and uh, also a state commissioner on the Indiana Civil Rights uh, Commission. So in that circle, I'm known as uh, Commissioner James Jackson. Uh, community leader, uh, president, of Far uh, president of the um, Far East Side Action Coalition, um, former host of Union in the Community on Saturdays on uh, Radio One, former host of uh, Real People, Real Voices on uh, Channel 40. Um, and uh, I am running for mayor of Indianapolis. That's outstanding. Now, you are the pastor of Fervent Prayer Church. How long has this church been uh, in existence? About 28 years. We mm -hmm. started in April 1995 on the west side of Indianapolis in uh, what used to be School 75. And uh, God blessed us, and now we're out here on the beautiful far east side of Indianapolis. Outstanding. And how long have you been in ministry altogether? Oh my, um, my first assignment in ministry was a drummer at 11 years old at the Macedonia Church of God in Christ at 15th and Columbia. Mm -hmm. Now I noticed that uh, you're wearing uh, your athletic gear and uh, you yeah. seem to be a pretty fit guy. Uh, do you have a regiment that you go through to uh, get in shape? I do, I like Under Armour um, for a few reasons. Uh, Under Armour uh, put their fitness clothes together to help augment your, your fitness um, routines. But also, you know, in the Bible it talks about having on the whole armor of God. Nice. And having that as armor to uh, be able to deal with spiritual things in the community. But uh, I think that everybody needs to make sure that they have what I would call under armor. Things like integrity, character, timeliness, definiteness of purpose. Um, we all need to have those kinds of things underneath, if you will, especially mentally. Our nation is dealing with a lot of mental health issues, and we need, if you will, Under Armour to help us as a nation to overcome some of the challenges that we're seeing. Now, some of that daily preparation uh, isn't just physical, because you do work out every day, or at least, I'm sure, uh, pretty regularly. Quite a bit, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. But also, you have a, uh, a morning um, podcast or a prayer meeting. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, my practice in prayer started over 20 years ago where I would, uh, my question was, how can I have more time to pray? And of course, you don't, fi you don't uh, find time to pray. You have to make time. So I started, uh, back then, uh, Jeff, there was a uh, radio shack. And so I went and got me a meat timer and uh, I would put five minutes uh, on the clock to help me to condition myself to spend time in prayer. And I would set my alarm clock back five minutes and then 10 minutes. And my goal was to get up an hour earlier than I was getting up so that I could spend time in prayer. So um, I eventually got to two hours um, of being able to get up early and spend time in reading my Bible <clears throat> because actually prayer is not just our talking to God. Prayer is spending time and reading the Bible, um, singing songs, listening to songs, and that fellowship that we need to have with God. Absolutely. Now you are reaching the masses with this uh, morning First prayer. hour prayer. First hour prayer. And at uh, what time does that start typically? 
6.30 a.m. on my Facebook page, James William Jackson. Mm -hmm. That was the one I started initially. Um, and it's probably about seven or eight years old now. It was pre-COVID. Um, a lot of these kind of things started after or during uh, the time everything got shut down. But I had been on uh, years before 2020, early 2020 when everything got shut down. But um, at 7.15, now we do YouTube and Facebookers can come on. So uh, both uh, YouTube and Facebook at 7.15, but uh, that one at 6.30 has just been going for a long time, longer than the other. Wow. So you've been involved with uh, virtual engagement uh, before it really became a thing. Yeah, I mean, I used to tell my colleagues, you know, get on Facebook, get on Facebook, and a lot of them would say, hey, you know, I, I don't have time for that. I don't want to do that. Um, but, not, but, you know, after COVID happened, uh, everybody was scrambling to try to get online. So fortunately, we were blessed to already uh, have a social media presence. We were already streaming for our church. Uh, we already had electronic giving set up. And that's important. Uh, a lot of times I think people are reactive versus being proactive. Mm -hmm. And in our lives, I think it's important that we prepare for what may come. There's a book called The Leadership Lessons of the Navy Seals. And in that book, um, one of the chapters is what if. And some of the examples they give is what if we parachute on a location and our gear lands a mile away from us, what do we do? What if uh, we parachute out and one of the team members breaks an ankle? So they're already prepared mm -hmm. for everything that might happen. And so that's gonna help me to be a great mayor. Yes, sir. <laughs> no, I had the uh, privilege of being a member at your church yeah. for years. Good and uh, I remember you uh, talking about pre-prayer power. Mm. And it was, it was more of a situation about being prepared as opposed to being reactional. Yeah. And so that kind of goes along with the uh, preparing for those scenarios that may not be convenient, right. you know, the, the preparing for the what if. And, I, and that's a good, uh, a good point you, you bring up and a good memory because I've carried that over into community work um, with the Far Side Action Coalition when we used to have more community meetings. I would always talk to community stakeholders and people that would come about the importance of developing relationships before something bad happens. When, when there's a catastrophe in the community, of course, everybody comes together. But then you got to try to get to know people. Uh, but if I already know you and we're on a first name basis and we're kind of already working together, then we're able to more quickly deal with the stuff that's happening in our community. Outstanding. Now, you are a very uh, active person in the community. Uh, you work with youth as well. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, well, it goes all the way back to when we started our Christian school in daycare which uh, your wonderful children, we had the privilege of having them as some of the first uh, children in our daycare and Christian school. Very proud of them. I see on Facebook and I hear from you all that they're doing great. But uh, we started with youth back then. And then we, I had what was called the Young Gentlemen's Academy. Mm -hmm. And the Young Gentlemen's Academy was for young men uh, to mentor them, I believe. A lot, a lot of times more is caught than taught. So I would dress up and um, I, I felt and thought that if they saw me, then they would want to be like me. And these were eight, nine, ten-year-old young men. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of mentoring, and that was uh, probably early 2000s mm -hmm. when we were doing that. And then in 2012, I heard uh, President Obama talk about shovel-ready jobs. And I had just gotten into community work. So I thought several ready jobs were jobs that you could just start doing right away. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot more legislation that went along with that. But um, we started what was, what's called Clean for Green. And the name came out of a community meeting where Captain Rice um, came up with that name. And he said, well, you know, we have a cleanup program and uh, it'll be in conjunction with City of Annapolis, Police Department, Sheriff's Department, whatnot. And you ought to call it Clean for Green. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we clean up the neighborhood and we pay the young people for doing it. So back then I said, well, I think it's important for us to build sustainability into it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we figured it where we could employ and mentor 
25 young people a week if nobody helped us. Uh, of course, after we started it, in 2013, I partnered with some pastors on the uh, uh, west side of Indianapolis, and we grew to 100 kids. And by 2015, we were up to over 500 kids from 26 zip codes. That is amazing. Yeah, and in that year, <coughs> Chief, then Chief Height said we had the lowest amount of juvenile crime that he had ever seen. Now, we're talking about uh, policing. Uh, how engaged and involved with you were you with that? With policing? Yes, sir. Um, well, they would come to our weekly, our uh, monthly meetings. And a lot of times, uh, East District particularly, I uh, was very involved with the commanders, knew them all, um, would spend time working with them. And a lot of things that they wanted to do in the city with regard to prevent crime prevention and new things, they would pilot those in the East District. So we would work with them here on the Far East Side. Um, Co uh, Commander James Waters, who um, was tragically killed in a traffic accident, um, he had the chess with the uh, police officers, uh, with the young people, Chad Connect, we did a lot of work with him, uh, Becky Lake, I mean a lot of them. They would do so well out here that they would get promoted to deputy chiefs. Well, <laughs> So it was good that we had them, and we would get a lot done. 46235 was not in the, what they call promise zones, and those are the areas where you have a lot of crime. Um, but we, 46235, we had gotten it where we were not even in those uh, problematic ish uh, <laughs> codes. Uh, and that was that whole community policing uh, model where it's not just police, it's everybody in the community working together for the greater good of the community. That's good because I was curious to know about there's a segment of the community that doesn't have that connection with the police. They don't feel uh, protected or, you know, connected to it where, you know, back when I was growing up, we had officer friendly and it was an initiative that was, you know, to teach children about their relationship with the police and the importance of them as part of our community. And um, if elected, how would you go about making that connection to the community that may feel a little disenfranchised? I think you wrap up, ramp up the uh, efforts that are already going on with the POW Club and making sure that uh, all the young people in our community are, can avail themselves to those opportunities. Um, I think making sure that we have officers out um, interacting with the community. Uh, we talk about getting out of the cars and, and meeting people. Um, making sure that police officers know their beat. You know, in the late 1800s, uh, Indianapolis was not commodious to commit crime in because um, then uh, the, the superintendent of police, they would call them the superintendent of police, uh, they made sure, and it was Superintendent Tolbert back then, <clears throat> that each officer knew their district. And they said, well, you want to roll over your district like a wheel knowing everybody in the community. So I think that uh, sergeants and commanders, the uh, patrol officers should make it their business to know who the pastors are in the community, um, who are the community leaders, who are um, leaders of community services, who are the business owners mm -hmm. um, in each community. Because I think in each community there are leaders, there are people, and officers um, have done that. Officer Tamar, who got promoted, she used to work with us in our youth jobs program, and she was phenomenal. She worked with the youth, especially the young ladies, and now she's working, I think she's a sergeant now, and she's working herself up the ranks. Mm -hmm. So that's a great example. Uh, and I think because of what she did and others have done and are mm -hmm. doing, when there are issues in the community, people say, well, I know you. Mm -hmm. I, I worked in the youth program with mm -hmm. you and things like that. How successful would you say our local police is in recruiting um, community members that look like the community? Uh, it hasn't been as successful as uh, one would hope. You know, I was on the Indianapolis uh, Police Merit Board, and one of our responsibilities was hiring police officers. A lot of people think that the Police Merit Board is just for firing police officers, which is not true. Um, the Police Merit Board is for making sure that the professional standards that help to govern the department, the department are up to date and on point. 
and also making sure that uh, we hire good people to be on the force. And then when there are disciplinary issues, then the merit board is responsible for hiring and or firing police officers. But, uh, well, uh, I should say firing police officers. But in the hiring piece, in the four years that I served, uh, it was difficult to hire uh, minority officers. You know, we'd get the files and we'd have to read through all the different things. We didn't have a lot of applicants anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we would have to read each applicant and their background and what was going on. And before that, being a pastor and working with my colleagues and the concerned clergy and the Baptist Ministers Alliance, I would st sit back and say what other people say, oh, it should be easy, and, you can, and it's not. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult because you have to make sure you're going over those files and looking at everything mm -hmm. of those who apply. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, to shift gears to our main reason for being here, uh, running for mayor, what made you want to run for mayor? Um, I would say public safety. You know, I, I have a passion and an assignment for public safety. Sometimes people say, well, what keeps you up at night? Um, not that it literally does, but I have a great concern for the safety of the city. I was going through some of my stuff the other day, and I, of course, before the internet, um, you got your most of your news with the paper. Mm -hmm. And so I have boxes of newspaper clippings and things, um, the history of public safety in Indianapolis and all of that. And whenever there were community meetings that involved public safety, I wanted to go to see how I could make a difference. Mm -hmm. And that's why we started the Youth Jobs Program, to try and get it on the front end. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the main reason mm -hmm. that I said, well, Indianapolis has been better with regard to public safety. Uh, we had the same problem in the 90s and through a collaborative effort, uh, leaders were able to fix it. And then we had uh, this same problem in the early 2000s and by 2009, um, through collaborative efforts um, and the grace of God, homicides were under 100 in 2009, 2010. 2011 and 2012, and I was part of that collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. So um, I would, I think, be able to bring a lot of that success over into what we're seeing now. It's unprecedented in the city of Indianapolis. We've never been over 200 homicides. Um, you know, if we had 130, that was considered high. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're talking about 500 or so people nearly 500 or so people killed in two years. Um, that's a big number, that's 500 families, and that's just those killed. That doesn't include um, non-fatals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saved, I screenshot something I saw on Facebook. I don't do a lot of scrolling, but sometimes I do see things. And there was a mother there with her son, and of course he got everything bandaged up. He had been shot in the face and he survived. And so when people get shot, we're, we are glad that they live, but you don't see the trauma, the families, the aftercare. And depending on where that person is shot, well, the family has to take care of that individual. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that person might be a paraplegic, maybe they lost their sight. So when you're talking about the high numbers of people that get shot in Indianapolis and now stabbed, mm -hmm. it, you know, we grew up in this city and it's rare that you hear about people getting stabbed. Mm -hmm. And now you 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 got people getting stabbed and shot. Yesterday I got an alert on my phone um, through the neighborhood app Ring that on 42nd Street, three people stabbed, one person shot. This is all in the same mm -hmm. uh, situation. So we're in a public safety crisis and it's gonna take uh, somebody like myself, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, that God has used in the past to work with other people to fix it. Now, it seems like being an Indianapolis uh, resident, uh, between, say, 38th Street and, say, 46th Street, from as far east to west, that's kind of been an area of concern. Is that kind of a target area for uh, public safety officials? Well, there are about six or seven areas. Um, you know, Martindale-Brightwood area, there's some areas on the west side. 
there are zip codes that are called promise zones. And, and really, if you look inside the 465 loop, uh, there's maps, crime maps. And uh, they use red dots to kind of show you where a lot of the things happen. And inside 465 is where most of the problems are taking place. I mean, it's spreading out now, but most of it takes place inside that 465 area. Mm -hmm. You know, public safety, of course, is something that you're really passionate about. Aside from that, what would you like to accomplish as mayor? Well, you know, my peace plan, the um, Jackson Peace Plan, and that using peace as an acronym, the E is education. Uh, and education is right up there with public safety because if you can catch it on the front end, then you don't have to worry about dealing with it on the back end. So making sure that every child in Marion County gets the best opportunity for the best education possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I Googled top, I, I Googled the uh, top schools in the United States about a, a couple of weeks ago and no Marion County schools in that top uh, 50 schools. Wow. And I Googled top schools in Indiana and um, no Marion County schools in the top 10. There was a school in Pike Township that was high up there with a high graduation rate. But I'm looking forward to the day when you Google, you know, when I'm elected and then four years after that, you Google top schools in America and you see Marion County schools at the top. You Google top schools in Indiana, you see Marion County schools up there. That's the way it should be. Wow. Now, uh, what things would you, do you currently not seeing addressed uh, that you would like to address? Uh, residential streets and interior roads. Um, a lot of times what we see with administrations, particularly the, the current administration, is um, they pave the roads and repair the roads you can see. But the, the interior roads, the ones that a lot of the residents have to drive on to even try to get on the main roads are crumbling. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I posted something on my Facebook page. I was over off of Fall Creek for a meeting. Um, and I got out the car and I shot the video and this is what would be called a uh, interior road and it's alligatoring is what they call it in that industry when the when the pavement starts to alligator it's all cracked up there were holes in it and um, it, we can do better than that mm -hmm. and we should do we should we should do better than that every road mm -hmm. needs to be drivable where you're not tearing up your car mm -hmm or having to replace a $200 rim mm -hmm. on your car or a $100 rim or a tire, mm -hmm. um, especially in the winter time. And this is possible. Yes. And, and if you're getting, as mayor, if you're getting around the city, you'll see that. And I think, I think a good mayor, not just a good mayor, but a great mayor is gonna be aware of what the people are experiencing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to drive on that street, you might not be thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But a, a great mayor needs to be out in the community as um, I have been, along with a lot of other people. And you'll see, in, in fact, right over on um, 30th Street, just before you get to Post Road, a resident, and I posted this on my Facebook page too, a resident made a makeshift sign and it said, danger pothole. So when you have residents making their own signs mm -hmm. to try and warn people of potholes, and this one's very deep and very dangerous, mm -hmm. And you could see where vehicles had scraped the um, asphalt mm -hmm. from having rolled into that hole. Is there a such thing as there being preferential treatment based on uh, zip code uh, for services to be given? Um, I know there's certain parts of town where if there's a pothole, it's fixed immediately. Or if there's anything with power lines or overgrown trees, those things are taken care of quickly or more quickly than in other uh, area codes or zip codes? You know, in Marion County, we're all in the same boat. It's all neglected. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled some paperwork. I, like I said, I, I have a lot of papers I used to keep. In 2009, uh, there's a document from a city county, um, a meeting where the, the counselors were all together. And every counselor, with the exception of maybe one, but as I recollect, we're talking about how residential streets and interior roads have been neglected. That was in 2009. Mm -hmm. So now here we are in 2022, 
And a lot of those same counselors will probably tell you that residential streets and interior roads are still being neglected. Wow. Now, uh, you are running for mayor. We call it the elephant in the room. You're an African American man running as a Republican. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your um, becoming a Republican and why you chose to run on the Republican ticket. Yeah, my journey. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, that kind of goes back to the Ballard administration. Uh, a good friend of mine, Ogin Williams, uh, when Greg Ballard won mayor. Uh, Ogin Williams was asked to be his deputy mayor of neighborhoods. And um, Ogin Williams was the first vice president. And uh, I think at that time, Reverend Dinkins was the president. And uh, when Mayor Ballard won, he asked Ogin to be his deputy mayor of neighborhoods, which created a lot of controversy uh, because there were a lot of Democrats who were not happy about his accepting the job. But he did accept it, and um, subsequently uh, he asked me, uh, he said that the mayor wanted me to be on the police merit board. I was serving at the time on the, public, the Board of Public Safety, I don't think they still call it that, but I was serving on the Board of Public Safety. And uh, Trustee Brown, he's a trustee back then, he was a counselor, he asked me to, to be on that board, and I was having a wonderful time serving on that board. But when Ogden Williams asked me, I left that and went to the police merit board. And um, that was my first interaction with Republicans and the Republican mayor. And so as time went on, the doors began to open for me for service in that party. Mm -hmm. uh, but before then, I had done a lot of research. And black folks, uh, we have a rich heritage in the Republican Party. And mm -hmm. the Republican Party started in 1854. Mm -hmm. Lincoln became president in 1856. If it weren't for slavery, it wouldn't be a Republican Party. Mm -hmm. That's it was created because of that. Mm -hmm. You know, in the beginning, you had the Federalist Party, and then you had the Democratic Republican Party. So Democrats and Republicans were one party. Uh, the Federalist Party went away, and then the Democrat Republican Party split over the issue of racism. I mean, uh, well, slavery. Mm -hmm. And Republicans, uh, the Republican legislators. Um, were with Lincoln on freeing the slaves, and the Democrats did not want that. Mm -hmm. People talk about civil rights legislation. Further back I can remember is Martin Luther King and all the marches, but actually it goes back further than that. Mm -hmm. Hiram Rebels, you ever heard of that name? Can't say that. Yeah, he was one of seven men who were the first black Congress. All seven were Republicans, uh, black men. He was born free, mm -hmm. he was a barber, <laughs> he um, was, went into the gospel ministry, mm -hmm. He organized uh, set, uh, three regiments of uh, troops, black troops, to fight in the Union Army. Uh, subsequently, he left um, all of that to uh, be president of what was then Alcorn College, which today is a HBCU. Mm -hmm. And uh, back then, uh, those men, those seven men, who were all black and they were Republicans, were pushing for civil rights legislation and uh, was getting it passed. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at that and of course my interaction um, with the Ballard administration, um, that helped me to make my decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I went through the diversity series that was offered by the GOP about a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there needs to be diversity in the Republican Party. Well, wow. now you're connected, you know, uh, pretty uh, richly connected here in the African American community here on uh, the east side of town, of course. How would you go about gaining the support of black voters uh, running as a Republican? Well, if it, you know, if the election was up to Facebook, I'd be mayor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, when I first put it on Facebook, um, there were just so many, almost a thousand reactions. And people saying that uh, if you're going to do polling, you know, Facebook polling, which is no such thing, I don't think, but uh, that they would vote for me and that they would split the ticket. Um, so it's just my service in the community. You know, I, I didn't just start serving in the community. I didn't just start doing community work. I didn't just start helping black people. Um, I've been adding value, quality of place, quality of life 
to black folks and the black community for almost three decades now. Mm. As you know, we are living in a very intense and divided political climate. And uh, how much of what's happening nationally would impact your policies and your dealings here on a local level? Well, with the Jackson Peace Plan, none of it. Uh, because you're talking about public safety, education, um, achievement, which has to do with vendor contracts and making sure that people are fairly treated. Uh, community bringing government closer to the people, making sure that people can interact with their mayor and their uh, local officials, and then of course economic development, making sure Indianapolis uh, stays strong with regard to the development of business and um, business opportunities. You know, Indianapolis is the economic engine for the entire state, mm -hmm. and what happens in Indianapolis helps and blesses people all over the state of Indiana. So you would be able to really address issues in a way that impact everyone, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. These are things that affect all people. Yeah, peace. Mm -hmm. You know, peace is, I think, if you ask uh, most people in the city of Indianapolis, that's what they want. Mm -hmm. You know. Now, if elected mayor, what's the first thing you'd like to do? Shout. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a miracle. Mm -hmm. um, but the first thing I would do is gather with uh, my team and gather with um, elected officials and um, begin talking about how we make Indianapolis the best place to live in America. And that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jeff, there are cities in this nation. I, I went to Jackson, Michigan with uh, Bishop Jefferson um, a, a few weeks ago. By the time this show airs, it may be a few weeks, so I'm saying it that way. But, um, and, and we were going to, I, meet, I met Bishop um, Ira Combs, Jr., and we were going through this city to get something to eat. And they only have four police officers and no crime. So there are cities in America, there are thousands of cities in America, and there are cities that have no crime. And there are reasons for that. And so I think that Indianapolis can be a city that's the best city to live in in America. And not only that, um, the goal should be no crime. Mm -hmm. And you know, in motivation, we always say, if you shoot for the stars and, and don't hit them, at least you hit the moon. <laughs> um, and during the ballot administration, we actually had a goal. Mm -hmm. There was a goal set by then Public Safety Director Scott Newman for homicides under 100. And the present administration has no goals as audacious as that. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to have leadership ability to reach those kind of goals. Absolutely. Um, now, you are the uh, lead pastor of Fulton Prayer Church. Uh, if elected, how would you go about managing your responsibilities as mayor and your responsibility as pastor? Well, that's a great question. And I've spent the last three years preparing my uh, church and my staff for that reality. And so we have some plans. Um, like I said, leadership lessons of the Navy SEALs, what if? Mm -hmm. So we have dealt with that what if, mm -hmm. and we've developed an extraordinary um, pulpit team. Mm -hmm. I've never thought that the church should be built around James Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't be where uh, I'm the only one that can hold the attention of a crowd. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be where the whole ministry is built around me. And so for the last, uh, actually for the last 28 years, it's been like that for our ministry. I've always shared the pulpit with talented and gifted and anointed others. And so we've really, really honed in on that over the last three years. I have an executive pastor, uh, Pastor Cookie DeLosa, who's phenomenal, a chief of staff, uh, Minister Nikki, who's phenomenal, and a helps ministry team that's second to none in the city. So a fervent prayer church will be fine. Uh, I don't think a church should stop just because its pastor becomes mayor. Absolutely. Now, if people wanted to uh, contact you or support your efforts in your uh, candidacy, how can they contact you? JamesJacksonForMayor.com. Yes, sir. Uh, we've got a beautiful website, and you can also donate there. And we're going to need all the help that we can get. Wow. 
Pastor, I really appreciate you taking this time to uh, visit with us today. Yeah. We certainly wish you all the best. Appreciate and we want to thank you all for tuning in to Jim TV with our special guest, James W. Jackson, who is running for mayor of Indianapolis. And I'm Jeff Payne. Thank you all for tuning in. Take care.